What is the real value of good taste? What does it mean to have a cultivated perspective and a good eye? And does this really mean anything outside of a world where a monetary value is placed on items considered to be tasteful? These are the questions posed by Dan Gilroy's latest film, Velvet Buzzsaw. It's an art world satire centred on a cast of characters that conspire to profit from the paintings of an artist who demanded his work be destroyed after his death. His entire body of work, though, is of course haunted by the artist's tortured soul, which soon wreaks havoc on everyone involved in the sale. The film is full of arresting and haunting imagery, spooky accidents and gory deaths, but Velvet Buzzsaw is not a horror movie. It is a camp appropriation of horror tropes in service of satire. Before I go into more detail, I need to let you know that I'm going to spoil the entire film, from the beginning to its very end, so if you haven't seen Velvet Buzzsaw yet, pause this video and go watch it on Netflix now. Like Gilroy's previous film, Nightcrawler, Velvet Buzzsaw is a direct satire set in the world it's criticising. Where Nightcrawler targeted the baseness of broadcast news and how it profits from real-life violence, Velvet Buzzsaw takes a broader bat to the various ills of the art industry. It incorporates a number of popular critiques, from modern art's snobbishness, its status as the reserve of the rich, and its capacity to commodify and defang counterculture, as well as how it transforms personal pain into commercial profit. Jake Gyllenhaal's character, the absurdly named Moore Vanderwalt, values his own aesthetic appreciation beyond anything else. He's worshipped in this world for his good taste, but he believes in aesthetics to the point of elevating them above any moral consideration. This is why he doesn't feel it's beneath him to loudly critique the decor at someone's funeral. That casket, what colour is that? Smog orange? Did they buy it on sale? <laughs> Not so loud. Seriously, imagine having to spend an eternity in that. Jesus, nothing is ever good enough for you. Well, it's my job, I'm selective. The film shares Morph's eye. Everyone is impeccably dressed, all the settings are ludicrously lavish, and every line of dialogue is deliciously witty. The film basks in its own artifice, so when it approaches the conventions of a horror film, it does so with a self-conscious smirk. In this scene, we watch a hilarious jump scare where the snobbish morph is frightened by the only working class person he meets in the film. And then there's this meta moment where the music indicates to anyone who's seen more than zero horror movies that something bad is about to happen. But then this is turned on its head when the music is revealed to be diegetic and the result of a wind flowing through the strings of an ornamental instrument. Velvet Buzzsaw appropriates horror style with ironic detachment, using the genre's conventions as a form of righteous vandalism. These characters who value good taste beyond anything else are killed through the conventions of the genre that sees bad taste as a virtue. The death scenes themselves are highly stylized set pieces, meant to be aesthetically gratifying rather than horrific, and it's easy to see that each death is symbolic punishment for the sins committed by each of the characters. Let's examine this by looking at three of the deaths in the film. Tony Collette's Gretchen is an insidious art world social climber who wants to summit the world's hierarchy, and in doing so, enforce her vision of taste. She achieves this with the powerful position she is given, but she is undone by the sphere, a work of art that we are told gives each person who interacts with it a unique and personalised experience. Her overreaching arm is severed by an art piece which champions subjectivity and therefore contradicts her hierarchical ideas of taste. Before her demise, Josephina says this. Space peddling graffiti murals. Jesus, what's the point of art if nobody sees it? What she means is why create outside art? It's not relevant and it makes no money. But then, as she waits in the car park, the first piece of art to attack her is a reproduction on her phone. This is art that everyone can see, but it also has little to no monetary value. And then she is eventually consumed by the paint from graffiti, the outsider art form she was denigrating minutes before. Eventually she is consumed by the art, and ironically becomes a barely seen feature 
of a work that everyone can see, but nobody can purchase. Then there's the velvet buzzsaw of the title, which also serves as the logo for Rodora's punk origins. When we meet Rodora, she is the picture of art world elitism, but her tattoos are evidence of an abandoned devotion to counterculture. She has betrayed her punk roots, but still trades on his reputation. At the end of the film, she is the only one who works out that the art is what's killing everyone, so she guts her home of everything that might attack her. But as she unconsciously adopts the pose of the painting she feared, she reveals that she is already a work of art herself, the commodification of counterculture made flesh. Her tattoo comes alive, and she is punished for her original sin. Velvet Buzzsaw gleefully brings its blades down on art industry professionals, but it spares its artists, and this is ultimately what prevents the film from becoming a wholly satisfying satire. The figure of Virtual Dees is presented as the archetypical tortured artist. He has the tragic backstory and the personal demons perfect to sell a collection of paintings. The story of the tortured artist has long been the modern art world's best sales pitch, and Velvet Buzzsaw is consumed by this notion, that artists put their real pain and suffering into their work, and this is then exploited by an industry of wealth and greed. The problem is that the film believes this myth, and doesn't apply its otherwise cutting, critical gaze in deconstructing it. The two characters who are spared a gory fate are the artists who recognise the independent power of Deese's work. One decides to rejoin his old art collective and abandon the morally bankrupt world of high art, and John Malkovich's character devotes himself to the process of his art, not its final product, as represented in the credit scene. In my opinion, it lets these artists off the hook, but there was space to satirise their self-importance. Artists who sell their suffering to the crowds and are guilty of the same superficiality that the industry professionals are. The film also raises some questions about scarcity and reproduction in the art world. Interesting ideas that undoubtedly contribute to the art world's elitism. But these ideas are merely paid lip service and don't receive any significant satirical focus. Probably because these are complicated issues that are inherent to an art form based around singular, irreplaceable artefacts, which doesn't play into the film's simplified focus on snobbishness and greed. Still, Velvet Buzzsaw is satirical camp of the highest order. It's a hilarious and razor-sharp movie about an industry that still deserved to have a few more holes drilled through its canvas. Now, I'm going to rest, because as we all know, critique is so limiting and emotionally draining. Thank you.